Hi everyone, I am uh, honored to introduce our guest speaker for the communication session at the Human Advantage Conference. Today, I am with my uh, colleague, Richard Chataway, who is the uh, CEO of BVNH Consulting UK, the author of a wonderful book, The Behavior Business, and also one of the BVA family champion for communication. And now we are joined by Professor Jonah Berger, marketing professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and internationally best-selling author of three books that I have loved personally, Contagious, Invisible Influence and The Catalyst. Dr. Berger is a world-renowned expert on change, word of mouth, influence, consumer behavior, and how product, ideas, and behavior catch on. He has published, I think, over 50 articles in top-tier academic journals, teach Wharton's highest-rated online course, and popular outlets like the New York Times, and Harvard Business Review often uh, cover his work. So, a lot. He's keynoted hundreds of events, including our events, and often consults for organizations like Google, Apple, Nike, and the Gates Foundation. So, welcome, Jonah, to the Human Advantage Conference. Hi, Jenna. Thanks uh, for joining us. And it's a great pleasure to, to have you here today. Um, first of all, I guess I wanted to ask uh, you about uh, why things catch on or, or go viral. Um, I guess it's something that all of us who work in communications are, are, are a bit obsessed with and we all want to achieve, but but very rarely do. Um, in your in your book, Contagious, which, like Eric, I, I thought was brilliant, um, you, you outlined six principles that make, uh, that make things become popular. Um, I guess since 2013 and the book came out, there's been a kind of explosion in available channels uh, for us in communications, especially in social media. Uh, I guess, how could you tell us how that's changed or shaped your thinking on, on how things become popular? Yeah, you know, I think um, when the book came out, uh, people often ask me, oh, why didn't you write about all the most recent examples of why things went viral. So there was a, you know, there was a New York Times review, I think, that said, oh, he doesn't talk about the Harlem Shake or whatever it is. Um, and my goal in writing the book wasn't actually to talk about the most recent examples uh, of things that caught on, went viral, or got word of mouth. My goal was to outline a framework of what drives people to talk uh, and share. Um, and I think my favorite books are the books that 5, 10, 15 years later, even after they come out, are equally good uh, as when they came out initially. Um, and timeless examples, actually, are a lot more important than uh, most recent examples. Because a lot of examples may be recent, uh, 10 years later, it's not going to be. And so, um, you know, I think the good news is uh, because, the, because Contagion is about why people share, not what they share, um, many of those reasons haven't changed. You know, the psychology of why we talk about things, why we share things, why we pass them on with friends, you know, that's not new. I didn't invent that, right? That's been happening for thousands of, of years. Um, uh, you know, cavemen and women shared things with one another. Um, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, people shared things with one another. And so the motivations to look good, uh, to share things that are top of mind, um, you know, the fact that emotions drive sharing, all of that is, is ancient and not new. Um, and so even though the channels we change have changed that we share things through, the motivations have not. Um, and so I think much has stayed the same. What I will say, though, is on the margin, there, there have been some changes or, or shifts, right? So um, if you look, there's certainly been more of a shift online. Now, so most word of mouth is offline. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, only about 7 to 10% of all word of mouth uh, is online. Now it's edging closer to 12 or 15%, but it's still we're near the 6 or 70% that we might think. Um, and so online is more uh, more important. Um, I also think some of the motives uh, for sharing on the margin of change, right? What things we might be triggered by uh, in the environment have shifted. Um, the dynamics of platforms have shifted a bit. But those six key steps, you know, social currency triggers, motion, public, practical value, and stories, those were the same before I wrote the book. They're the same uh, when the book came out, and and they haven't changed. How we apply. You know, as a as communications professional, as a marketing professional, how we apply those principles may have shifted a little bit based on the environment that we're dealing with. But the principles themselves, the motivations have, have stayed very much. 
that's really interesting yeah that i um i think that's that's a, a really important point to remember that you know i guess evolution doesn't work that fast that, that we as people don't <laughs> haven't fundamentally changed over the course of the last 10 years um and, and our motivations accordingly and i guess with that in mind one one sort of challenge that we sometimes get from clients i guess is that you know we, we talk about for example you know our current circumstances in the current context in which we live and the kind of post-covid world um for example um and and you know and and therefore you know has has COVID for example changed us and how the way we can influence people uh, changed? Um, do you think is there any impact specifically around COVID and the impact that's had on the world over the last couple of years that's, that's kind of shaped your thinking on that and 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 how how we can make things go viral? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that COVID has done is it's forced us all to change, right? Working mm -hmm. from home, ordering things online. And now as we come out, hopefully out or move out towards out of COVID, or at least a little bit out of COVID, <laughs> we have the opportunity now to sit back and say, well, which of these things do we want to keep? And which one of these things do we want to go back to normal? Um, uh, you know, um, I think many companies said, oh, we'll work from home uh, because we have to. And now some companies said, oh, we need to be back in the office because we have to. But why do we have to? It is actually the best way for people to work for some jobs and some parts of some jobs. Certainly, it's definitely the best place for other parts of other jobs. It may not be the best place for some jobs. Being back in the office may have no value. and It may actually be better for the company to allow people to work remotely because you can get a better workforce and they're happier and they can spend more time because they don't have to have an hour and a half commute each way. And so I think what smart companies are doing is not thinking about what they have to do, but the opportunities that COVID have provided uh, us, um, the learnings we can gain from these shifts in consumer and customer behavior, and what we should do as a result. Same with um, you know digital marketing. Same with um, uh, you know selling people online rather than physical stores. What are stores good for? Should we get rid of stores? No. But do we need stores? Right. What do stores add above and beyond digital? What are they good at? What are they not good at? And how can we use that to be more effective? And I think that's what smart companies are doing. Mm. It's really interesting because I think um, if you think of, um, I guess, you know, we uh, there's been a lot of talk and certainly clients that we speak to about um, digital transformation and we help them with a lot of challenges around that. And and what's been interesting, I guess, uh, our experience with that in COVID is this, that it's just accelerated existing trends, I guess, if you see what I mean. Um, and I guess, you know, it, it, it kind of works both ways, doesn't it? Because obviously we're seeing companies like Amazon are opening physical stores <laughs> um, and, and moving you back into that world. So it's, 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 um, uh, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily one way, um, one way traffic in, in that sense. Um, yeah, and I think smart companies think about, well, why do I have a store? What is a store for? Digital is important. Yes. And maybe John, uh, um, you mentioned that things have not evolved so rapidly since the launch of uh, Contagious. Uh, so could you, for our uh, audience, summarize your famous acronym steps? How to uh, really be successful? So STEPS uh, stands for the six key drivers uh, of why people talk uh, and why they share. Uh, social currency is the first S. Uh, T is for triggers. Uh, e is for emotion. P is for public. The second P is practical value. Uh, and the second S is stories. Um, and those are the six key drivers of why people talk, why they share, and all sorts of things to catch on. From products, services, to ideas. It's not random luck, chance why some things succeed and others fail. The more we understand the science behind mouth and social transmission, we can engineer products and services uh, and ideas to be more successful. Okay, thanks a lot. Good and rapid summary. And for sure, uh, we encourage our audience to read the book to know more. You have also a wonderful example, which illustrates how to use each of these uh, drivers. Oh, yeah, sure. Definitely, you know, check out my website. There's a whole bunch of resources there with more information about each of the principles and uh, how to apply them. Brilliant. Um, I was I wanted to uh, to ask you as well, I guess, about your your most recent book, uh, The Catalyst. And um, and there we'll see you outline five factors that impede change and, and how to mitigate them. And I guess relevant to what you, for example, that you just gave about, you know, those businesses, how businesses are adapting the post COVID world and remote working versus versus being back in the office. Um, I guess, you know, it, 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 it would be great to hear your perspectives on that in terms of 
um, how that that um, those factors, I guess, apply in that in that uh, scenario. Um, you know, what are what are the things that are impeding those changes that you mentioned? That the 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 ability for us to make those changes that are necessary in the in the post COVID world. You know, it, it's been an interesting time to be writing about and thinking about change. Uh, mm. Obviously, we were dealing with an immense amount of change even before COVID. So you talked about digital transformation and the like. And, um, uh, you know, I, I wrote the Catalyst in part because of having worked with various companies and organizations. But they all had the same problem, which is they all had something they wanted to change. Right? The marketers and the salespeople want to change customer minds. Uh, leaders wanted to transform organizations. Startups wanted to change industries. Nonprofits wanted to change the world. But as we all know, change is really hard, right? Often we push, we pressure, we cajole, and nothing happens. Uh, so the question I sort of wondered is, could there be a better way? Could there be a better way to change minds and drive action, not pushing, but by do something else? And that's what the catalyst is all about. It's a different approach to change. It's really about thinking about why people change and why they don't, and how by removing barriers can we change more and more likely. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun working with different companies around this time, uh, both in COVID-related things and otherwise, and uh, think about how to remove barriers to change. Great. And I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that I think um, uh, that, that our, our audience would be really interested to hear, I guess, in your perspective on is, is that in terms of those hurdles to change and removing those barriers, which I guess is, you know, is a, is a really... Um, important part of everything we do in behavioral science, you know, I guess, you know, the, the, the whole concept of making it easy is about removing removing hurdles to change, isn't it? Um, which of the, those hurdles do you think marketers most commonly fall foul of? And, and why do you think that is? Um, you know, I think in marketers in particular, um, mm -hmm. so uh, the Catalyst has a framework called the Reduce Framework. Marketers tend to fall most prey to the R, which is uh, reactants, right? Um, when we push people, they often push back. They often do the exact opposite of what we want them to do. Uh, when ad comes on the television, we switch the channel. When uh, you know an email comes in from a marketer that we're not expecting, we delete it. Um, uh, you know, we avoid or ignore persuasion attempts to avoid being persuaded. Even worse, we counter argue. We think about all the reasons why what someone is suggesting is not something we want to do. And so I think marketers' intuition is well, let's push people more, right? Let's add more facts, more figures, more reasons more information. If I just show them one more ad, they'll come around. And the problem is it doesn't work, right? Uh, because the more we push them, the more they dig their skills in and, and resist. And so really at the core, what we need to do is give them back some agency, allow for agency. We need to stop trying to persuade them and encourage them to persuade themselves. We need to stop trying to sell so much and, and get them to buy in. And so in the book, I talk about a variety of ways uh, to do this from asking rather than telling, um, from uh, you know providing a menu or giving people choice, highlighting a gap between attitudes and actions, a variety of strategies sort of give them back some sense of control or freedom. The more they feel like they're in the driver's seat, the more interested they'll be in, in helping us out. Okay. Jonah, maybe a, a last uh, question. What single piece uh, of advice would you give communicators and marketers to drive lasting change? Yeah, to drive lasting change. I think you need to understand your customer. If there's one, one thing, it's understanding your customer. And customer there is in quotes, right? So some of us don't think we have a customer. If I'm a nonprofit and I'm trying to get people to donate money, I don't think I have a customer. I'm not selling anything. Well, but you do have a customer. Your customer is a donor. Um, if you're trying to change behavior within an organization, your employees are your customer, and they're not a customer, they're not buying something from you. But if you don't understand them and how they work and why they're not doing what you want them to do in the first place, it's going to be really hard to get them to change. And so it's it's not about um, uh, marketing, it's not about communication, it's about understanding that person or people that you're trying to change or organization that you're trying to change and using that to help make change more, more likely. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.